Well, aren't we glad it's not tomorrow? It's gonna, we're going to get eight inches of snow tomorrow, and, uh, and I have a suspicion many of you wouldn't be able to come tomorrow, but we're very lucky that you can all come today. And I want to say thank you. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm uh, especially pleased to be able to welcome uh, Presidente Gonzalez. This is a great opportunity for us. This is the second uh, in a series that we're now hosting at the Brzezinski Institute on Geostrategy, the second of our Statesman Laureate programs. And we're just delighted to have someone of his stature and significance who's joining us today to share his views. Uh, I had the privilege of talking with President Gonzalez um, in my office just a few minutes ago, and I came to learn that he is, uh, he's a man who loves to work with his hands. He does carpentry, he um, does iron work, he does work with stone, it's really remarkable. And it reminded me of a, something that Sam Rayburn, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, famously one time said that, uh, and he was talking about politicians, he said, you know, any jackass can kick down a barn door, but it takes a carpenter to build one. <laughs> you know? And President Gonzalez re responded by saying, we have a slightly different saying. It takes 300 years to build a cathedral and only three hours to destroy it. And it's exactly that same sentiment, that we're in the middle of a time, a tumultuous time, especially in Europe, a conf confusing time, so many tensions, and we're desperately in need of carpenters. We need people that are building. And uh, Presidente Gonzalez is a builder. He has been chairing uh, for the European Union a commission that's looking to the future of the European Union. And I'm hoping that he will spend some time sharing with us his insights. I'm quite honestly worried because America needs a coherent and unified and strong Europe. And things are tense, things are divided. It's a very tough time. And so we need now to use this opportunity to reflect on the challenges of the day. And we look forward to hearing the voice of a carpenter who is building for the future. So with your applause, would you please welcome uh, Prime Minister Gonzalez. We're delighted to have him here. Thank you very much. It seems uh, like a paradox to contribute to building the future when one's own future is coming to an end. But I was struck in Japan at a visit that I made when I was still young, 1985-1986, that there was a, a retiree from a large uh, Japanese corporation who was 93-94 years old. I went to a workshop in which he was working with many young people. I'm talking about 1985, and he worked designing what the city was going to be, which is a great concern of everyone today and then, looking to the year 2020. Obviously, it went beyond his own lifetime, but he was working on that. I've been introduced as an artisan, it is true. Only in my free time do I engage in politics. And I'm delighted. I, I love working with my hands. I think it clears my mind, and it puts me at ease with respect to worries, concerns. Now, I proposed to the center uh, that I, uh, and I thank the center and Mr. Brzezinski, I proposed to share a few thoughts. Now, when I was pr proposed that I talk about some of the threats to security seen from a European perspective, and I would say, from the European perspective, but also from the perspective of the United States, I proposed three issues. What was happening, even though there are many more, what was happening with the crisis of the Ukraine and the relationship with Russia? Next, what did this, uh, what does the Islamic State represent as a semi heir in conflict with Al the Al Qaeda? And, well, within Islam, uh, one speaks of an integri integralist uh, outcome, which is therefore exclusivist, which leads to a violent uh, interpretation of Islam, and therefore what was happening in the Arab and Islamic world, and uh, by extension in the Islamic world, with 
the eruption of this new wave of integralism uh, that uh, constitutes a threat. And a third thought, uh, which is how will relations be rebuilt between the United States and China if China, as I believe, considers that the stage based on the Nixon Deng Xiaoping Pact is uh, surpassed some 40 years later. China feels that a new stage should be ushered in. And in my impression, and uh, I'm not conveying anything that might be considered information, but my impression is that they wanted to see Asia in a manner not unlike the Monroe Doctrine. That is to say, Asians should resolve the problems of Asia. They'll say this with the strong role of China and the reworking of the relationship with the United States would have to be done, con bearing in mind this consideration. Now let me begin with the first. And I'd like to be brief so as to be able to field questions. I think that it was February 12th when the Minsk uh, uh, two uh, treaty, uh, Germany, France, uh, Merkel, and Hollande attempted with Mr. Putin to seek a peaceful solution to the Ukrainian conflict, and a peaceful solution which does not appear to be yielding results. Minsk I already failed, and I will tell you straight out what I think. I believe, and I did communicate with some of the people who I maintain relations with in the European institutions uh, after the two-year effort on the future of Europe, that report that reference was made to. And I thought that the agreement or the uh, uh, the Minsk II agreements had some defects which might uh, lead quickly to their failure. The first notable defect is that one did not recall a principle which I think is basic for maintaining international stability, which is unrestricted respect for the territorial integrity of states. And in that agreement, Europe's uh, position on Crimea was not uh, recalled, an annexation which violates the basic principles of international law. Even though Russia says that the European Union and the United States did not respect that principle of territorial integrity either when recognizing the independence of Kosovo. But what I found of most concern was not just that, but that the agreement did not have a time frame that would impose the withdrawal of mercenaries and Russian soldiers in the conflict area. And even more serious, there was no agreement for the control of the border between the east of Ukraine and Russia uh, which should not be in the hands of the rebels and the Russians. Therefore, they should be in the hands of the Ukrainian government, if possible. And if not, they should be in the hands of uh, some force of, the, of interposition. For if there were not an agreement with those demands, it seemed obvious that what happened was going to happen. And what happened is very similar to what we experienced in the Balkans with some variants. The empty spaces were taken advantage of uh, from, uh, from one agreement to the next. Some of them were taken advantage of so as to continue moving towards what? Well, actually, the first thing that happened with uh, Bartsevo is what happened with Bukovar in that uh, crisis in the Balkans. And I think that in addition, the uh, pr purpose, obviously, Serbia did not have Russia's intent, and that might be the difference, but the, pr the purpose of Russia is being uh, fulfilled. Now, I made those comments four days after the Minsk II agreements, and then well, I say all, all of this uh, are statements I made internally. They're not public statements. Uh, on the 18th, when I saw that 
the rebels of Donetsk and Lugansk had succeeded in cutting off access uh, to coal uh, long after the agreements. They are unifying the border of the rebels in the east of the Ukraine with Crimea, leaving Odessa and Mariupol isolated. So I think there's a purpose there, a determination. And the final result of that is that Kiev is not going to have any access to the sea, the paradox that the Soviet Union experienced in its last period and Russia afterwards with the difficult uh, access to the uh, Black Sea without uh, agreements such as there were, then the Ukrainian state would become inviolable. And that eastern part of the Ukraine would have contiguity that would isolate, among others, Odessa. And Odessa isolated from uh, Kiev. Kiev has very little viability. Therefore, I think that the agreements not only are not being carried out, but the uh, Russia's determination is to take advantage of the contradictions or the weakness of the positions of the European uh, Union, and I should add uh, the United States as well, in all likelihood, so as to go forward in that purpose, which may not be a clear or definitive purpose of annexing the entire territory, although in Crimea they take that for granted and don't want any turning back. But uh, it's a, it would involve at least a change in the uh, balance of forces so that the Ukrainian government would once again be a pro-Russian government without any special ties either to European Union or the countries of the Atlantic Alliance, including, of course, the United States. And the purpose is being carried out. There is a certain counter-indication for Russia or for Putin, yes. Uh, yes, Putin in part maintaining the theory that the pro-Russians, those who feel a Russian identity, have the right to be with Russia. Indeed, they have the right to self-determination. That non-existent right is becoming a principle of ethnicity, indeed of cultural ethnicity, which is going to pose very serious problems at the eastern border with the uh, Caucasian republics as a whole. But this is seen more in the medium and long term than in the immediate term. And in the communications, nobody recalls that the Russian Federation itself, if uh, the territorial disintegration of countries such as the Ukraine goes forward, or the latent threat to countries of the former Soviet Union, or that were in this or orbit, uh, of the former Soviet Union, such as the Baltic countries, could have serious re uh, repercussions for the Russian Federation itself and for its own territorial uh, integrity for the same reasons that it branches to defend the right self-determination of the pro-Russians in the eastern uh, part of uh, Ukraine or in the U Crimea because they don't feel Russian. They are republics that are part of the Russian Federation, but they have an Islamic identity. But they also know that Europe and the Western world are going to prioritize the second of the packages of what I wanted to talk about, which is what to do with what is called today the Islamic State, which is a spin-off of Al-Qaeda with conflicts with Al-Qaeda. What is going to be done with that implosion of Islamic integralism, which is exclusionary, which is uh, all-encompassing, which takes advantage of ignorance, which moves on to indignation, and the indignation is then translated into violence. What is to be done with that? Well, that is a priority question for us all, and Putin may know that. He may know that he is objectively more an ally than an enemy vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic threat, and therefore that Europe is not going to distance from Russia, distance itself from Russia, in the case of complications, which I find or think are inevitable in the uh, Caucasic part of the Russian Federation. So therefore, we have the first threat. Are you uh, not in favor of peace negotiations? I would say yes. Plus, I would say I think that uh, France and Germany's effort is a healthy one. I would add that that effort is passively endorsed by the European Union, 
but there is not a European Union negotiating. No one should deceive themselves about that. That is, it is an interesting initiative on the part of the French president and the German chancellor. For France, it's also an interesting path because it recovers a political position in the context of a not very balanced relationship with Germany. Indeed, the struggle against the economic crisis in the European Union, or how the economic crisis is to be addressed. So therefore, I think it's a healthy effort. The rest of the countries have not been involved in the effort, although they endorse it and explain it, and explain it positively. But they see that the role of Great Britain has disappeared, and the tie with the United States is not seen clearly. It's one of the problems that is uh, of concern to me, and it's been of concern dating back 25 years. That is to say, the distancing of the Northern Atlantic relationship, which had a certain logic in light of the changes unfolding in the world. It's difficult to repair it urgently when all of a sudden a personality such as that of Putin emerges who wants to reconstitute a certain power, whether or not that's a fantasy, of the Russian Federation in relation uh, to the old power that has now disappeared, that is to say the Soviet Union. But what is difficult to reconstitute is a more solid alliance, formally it exists, with more serious coordination of the United States and the Soviet Union. That is to say, to have the Atlantic axis become into style once again, with so much displacement there's been toward the Pacific, even mindful of the possible triangulation of that axis with Latin America, it's difficult to do this, strategically speaking, nonetheless, it seems to me that it's essential. We need to make sure that what is happening in the Ukraine not happen, and I believe it's inexorably going to happen. We can be discussing about gradual adjustment of sanctions and so forth, but once territorial contiguity in the eastern Ukraine is consolidated, that would continue to Crimea and that would isolate Odessa and Mariupol, well, then, eastern Ukraine will not depend on the Kiev government. And once it doesn't depend on the Kiev government, it's very difficult for the Kiev government to maintain a minimum of stability so as to continue to be a government with the characteristics that it has. What can be done? Uh, one can await a response by the uh, European Union or can one await a response by the European Union to uh, negotiate integration uh, of, uh, with perhaps a prior phase of uh, integration of Ukraine into the European Union? I don't think so. I don't think that, that can be anticipated. I don't think it should be discarded. But there's nothing that would, uh, in the way of a strong sign to President Putin, that Europe and the United States are decided to maintain the territorial integrity of the Ukraine and its independence vis-a-vis -vis external pressures. I'm not saying that there's no expressions of will uh, that appear to be firm in the literature. What I am saying is that Putin doesn't believe them, and he doesn't believe them, and I'm sorry for telling you this, but right, and he's right not to believe it. Therefore, he's comfortable. He has a purpose. Europe does not. The United States is dubious as between the European position, the petition made from here to put you, to arm Ukraine. Well, I don't know if arming uh, Kiev would be sufficient. I've drawn a parallel with what was happening in the Balkans. There are many differences. There is no real threat for those who feel pro-Russian in Kiev, in the heart of the country as there were for those who felt Serbian in the Cro Croatian part of the Balkans. So there are differences, major differences. But even so, in Kiev, there continues to be, as there has been for many years, a weak government, a fragmented country. And at this time, in the part occupied by the rebels, there are many signs that we don't want to see ethnic cleansing or expulsion of those who are not followers 
of the strategy of separation of fracture. So the first uh, issue of concern to me, which I put before you, and there's difficulties figuring out how to respond to it. Now the second topic I would like to address is the Islamic State which has come to symbolize the whole phenomenon of integralism. It has many explanations, many implications, great impl major implications, for example, even though it's uh, very much a side issue, has nothing to do with it, but it will enter into the complexity of the matter if there is or is not normalization of relations with Tehran. That has implications so as to uh, figure out how there will or will not be stability in the zone. It has implications for Saudi Arabia, which is probably, is certainly going through an institutional crisis that is rel was uh, relatively unforeseen and is quite serious. And it has implications for everyone. Imagine, for Egypt, it's been a back and forth Mubarak fell, a government came in that wasn't uh, capable of governing the country but did win uh, the vote, then uh, followed by a military government, and a military government whose f the front of, that is of greatest concern to it is the Sinai. Nonetheless, it has to move a lot of its force to the Libyan front. The disaster that has occurred in Libya so there's been centripetal force and centrifugal force. First there was the centripetal force of terrorist movements and then uh, centrifugal force through Mali distributing to all uh, everywhere. This has required Egypt to move forces to the Libyan border and at the same time to neglect, well, to be much more concerned but less uh, capacity to pay attention to the Sinai border. Therefore, there are many implications in addition to those that are well known. The, those that are well known, decomposition, internal war in Syria, the uh, decomposition of Iraq in principle with the non-acceptance of a, a Shiite uh, majority by the Sunni minority which was displaced uh, after the fall of Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War. So it's a difficult s situation. I wanted to hear some, I wanted to share some of uh, what is of concern to me. Uh, addressing it as I did the first uh, point, defending the principle of territorial integrity and uh, non-violation of that territorial integrity, which has been taken up by the United Nations, is the only relative advantage under that viewpoint of the Islamic State, uh, unlike pure and simple terrorism, but the Islamic State is calling into question the territorial integrity of the countries that it has attacked. It's a completely different strategy. It's divided them. In my opinion, the time has come for what we call the international community, where the media always define it in those terms, but what they're actually referring to is what is the United States going to do with more or less strong uh, support or more or less declining support from Europe. Well, that's the international community. The international community has to react. Well, what are you referring to? Well, uh, the reference is to that. They're not referring to the Arab League, nor to the Islamic Conference. They're not referring to Japan or China. They're not referring to Russia. The international community is what I've just said in uh, the slang. What is the United States going to do? What is Europe going to do? The United States has very little room for maneuver to do much more after what has happened in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so on. And the threat, I believe, the, the time has come, uh, this threat with territorial content, whether it's counterattacked or defended, with a clear, it's going to require clear leadership from the Arab world and the Arab League. Now, I can tell you with a feeling that I verify or that there's a feeling, well, some of the Arab countries that are threatened by the violent uh, Islamic integralism have called for action. If it's a member of the international community, as I've just identified it, the United States or Europe, that provokes or causes the death of a terrorist. Well, actually, in the Muslim world, no one applauds. 
Moreover, the effect on the integralist movement is to spur it onward. When the confrontation is one Arab versus another Arab, then the popular sentiment is different. I can cite, uh, I'll give you a snapshot of what I want to say. When that horrible video appeared of the Jordanian pilot burned in the cage, the Jordanian people, for the first time, took to the streets massively, calling for revenge, calling on its government to act. This, it did not come out in respect of any of the previous videos. I'm just describing, I'm not reproaching. Even when there have been massacres of uh, Muslim Arabs or Christian Coptics who are also Arab by these integralist groups, radical integralist groups, it didn't happen either. It happened when they touched their very essence. The, so I think we need to reflect and decide that protagonism in the fight against the Islamic uh, State should be the protagonism, the leadership of the Arab countries uh, that can, uh, when they decide to do the only thing they can do, which is to share the effort to get rid to remove them. That is not going to happen through an, uh, aerial bombing. And I don't think that the international community or the West should make the mistake once again of being the protagonist on the land in fighting the Islamics, Islamists, even if it has the quote-unquote formal support of some Arab governments that feel threatened. Because the effect will not be that of bringing an end to the threat. Rather, it'll, uh, the effect will be to make the threat uh, proliferate. Now, that is my only thought before saying something, well, we were discussing this before I uh, came in. I was in Marrakesh a few days ago, and I was given the honor of uh, being given the Aber Royce Award of the University of Cordoba and of a university that is based in Marrakesh. And the Aber Royce Award is to uh, reward the getting along of both sides of the Mediterranean, but its subtitle is for a humanist Islam. So I uh, devoted some time to describing Aber Rois, who is very relevant today. He lived only 900 years ago. And the experience that he had at that time is what we are experiencing right now. And I told about that. His scientific thinking was very interesting. He was the first one who described the function of the nervous system as a scientist. But that's been taken uh, overtaken by uh, scientific evolution. His philosophical thinking and his religious thinking. But well, his philosophical thinking has not been overtaken. He created what was called the Western School of Islam. What I'm telling you is not gratuitous, because I believe that in this conflict that we have with integralism, with Islamic terrorism, and so on, or Islamist terrorism more than Islamic, we have to understand what's happening within. And Abu Royce already suffered it. He, des he, uh, he described it, and he suffered it. He described it philosophically when he took Aristotle. We know Aristotle because the Arab intellectuals drew on him, uh, especially the uh, Western school, and in particular, Abel Reus. And after that, it was a Christian, St. Thomas of Aquinas, contradicting Aristotle, or rather, Abel Reus, made some comments on Abel, what Abel Reus had said, but it drew on Aristotle's philosophy and uh, to reach the conclusion that philosophy, with its values, is not useful for theological interpretations, that philosophy is one thing and religion is another. In the Eastern School of Islam, well, since 60 years later, Aristotle's philosophy was taken up. And based on the philosophy, theological interpretations of the existence of God in Islam was considered uh, to be shown. The same happened in Christianity. So Abu Rois, ahead of his time, said, philosophy touches on 
imminent matters and religion transcendental issues. One may be in agreement philosophically with Aristotle and have whatever religious beliefs one wishes. But Aristotle's philosophy is not useful for justifying uh, religious interpretations or theology. Now, the result of that marvelous adventure of Averroes was naturally that he was uh, condemned to exile as a heretic, and his books were burned in the public uh, square of Cordoba, and he died in Marrakesh. He was expelled by Almohade, a caliph, who, uh, in the back and forth of the border in Spain at the time, got to the caliphate of Cordoba, very much influenced by a hardcore Islamic integralism, which has been around for only 1,000 years, which is what led his writings to be burned in the public square, and it provoked, uh, well, not only uh, were the uh, books burned, but the writers as well. They tried to rehabilitate him three months before his uh, death, and then the Caliphate of Cordoba disappeared. The Western School of Islam, the humanist interpretation of Islam, disappeared, and the Eastern School of Islam uh, gained hegemony. But the debate continues alive. So what am I driving at? Well. It's an appeal, and it's only fitting in a center such as this, to consider that this is not just a question of uh, power relations. It is also a question of understanding the other, and not even of a Western interpretation of the other, but rather of getting into the roots of the interpretation of Islam, which is not uh, single-minded as to in terms of what's being done within Islam. In other words, we need to win the battle, which Abed Royce was waging at that time. He said that nothing in the Quran justifies any discrimination against women. He said this 900 years ago. No interpretation of the Quran allows for the discrimination or exclusion of women. And this is an appeal for us to think about how in this complex and ever more difficult world in which we uh, live, after getting past that balance of terror, which had its uh, difficulties, but in a supposedly rational manner, after that which we've left behind, we, have, we face new challenges. And among the new challenges, the battle is not just a battle of weapons. It is a cultural battle as well. But in order to wage a serious cultural battle, one must situate oneself in the place of the other in order to figure out how it is possible that for a debate to come about in Islam or to reemerge in Islam so that an Averroes type humanist interpretation of Islam can once again gain currency a thousand years later. Is this possible? Yes, it is. One of the problems that we have is that that has not been done. Indeed, the knowledge we have of Islam, we have it with a very acute view sometimes, but a very Western view, which does not really understand the world from which Islam, where Islam exists, from the Maghreb to the Arabian Peninsula in the entire Muslim world, including the non-Arabic Muslim world, we can discuss that later, the country with the greatest relative stability, with a law on women's rights and considerable degrees of freedom, even though uh, not having it gone through the Arab Spring, continues to be Morocco. Few people understand it, but it's worth paying attention to that anchor of security this openness to good relations and to a cultural interpretation closer to what I'm talking about it should be capable of surviving so many temptations such as those that are occurring as one goes along uh, through uh, northern Africa, uh, Algeria, which is hanging by a thread, the disaster in Libya, the complicated situation in uh, Egypt, uh, the uh, jumping to Saudi Arabia, what uh, Jordan is doing despite its uh, 
resistance, the disaster of Syria and Iraq. I don't need to explain the whole thing. And in the middle of this, a whole, uh, a small problem, which is at the epicenter of all the problems, and it seems that it's never going to be possible to resolve it, the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Well, that is uh, the context in which we're moving. I have drawn attention to the Maghreb uh, because I think it's worth reflecting on a country that we should respect and coordinate from Spain. This would be a priority, but also uh, for the United States. And I'm talking about Morocco. Morocco, which has a very fluid border in the south, a lengthy border with uh, Algeria that has never been peaceful. Well, it is the only one that is formally closed uh, after uh, after the agreement to open North and South Korea border. But uh, it's technically closed, but formally that, but that's just a formality. And then finally, I think that China considers the U.S.-China agreement is uh, made. Uh, does that affect Europe? Europe has very little to say. I recall President Chirac at some point in time uh, with a conflict with North Korea one of the times it flared up. And he said France wasn't consulted. Well, it's a different problem, a problem of different dimensions. So I, I, I don't mean to be sarcastic. But in the next 10 years, we are going to experience the most important tectonic movement in the reconstitution of global relations. And I would say relations of power, power relationships, because China and this has a historic logic, is going past the status quo that resulted from the agreement between Deng Xiaoping and Nixon. Forty years later, they want to, to review that agreement. They want Asia to be for the Asians in terms of conflict resolution, and they'd like the role of the United States in the Far East to change, to change with respect to what, what? Well, nothing more or less than the status that it has acquired since World War II, among other things, with the defensive limitations of Japan, among others, not only. Therefore, Japan has to make an effort, and one already notes this, uh, anticipating that something like this might happen, uh, to uh, bo bolster its arms spending and its defense spending. One already notes this, it's already happening, but that tectonic, tectonic uh, movement is uh, the most important in the medium and long term. So most difficult, how to deal with the Middle East and the threat of integralism, because we have yet found the way to approach it, especially so as to take a step which, it's, which seems to us impossible. I believe that the role of the international community, as I have described it, is to support the Arab states that decide to take the step to put an end to a threat that affects their own territorial integrity and their own survival. Not, don't ask for the support, or, or rather not uh, seeking their support, but rather supporting them. It's a Copernican, it's a Copernican change. And now uh, the Islamic State has very different uh, nuances from Al Qaeda. The battle will only be won on the ground. And I think that on the ground, it would be very negative for, because of its multiplier effect for there to be a battle with uh, the so-called international community or the West at the head. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, please go right ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Uh, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS. Um, that uh, looks after Europe and Eurasia. And I think, uh, Mr. Minister, you've given us an incredible amount of rich discussion to uh, uh, provide some great questions and, and comments. What I thought we would do for the next few minutes, with your permission, is to focus a little bit more on Europe. Uh, and if I may, maybe a question or two about Spain and some of the domestic developments uh, within Spain today. And then I will 
hold myself back because I have so many questions for, the, for uh, Minister Gonzalez. And then we'll open the floor for some question uh, uh, period. So let me begin by asking, uh, if I may, one statement that you stated that I, it struck me. Vladimir Putin has a purpose. Europe does not. The founding vision of Europe was to make war materially impossible. But it seems to me Europe does not have a new and positive vision, a purpose. It's right now the narrative is being filled by Vladimir Putin of a weak and a decadent Europe. Um, what is Europe's new positive vision for Europe? And do you think it can achieve this considering it's really gone through an extraordinarily difficult time economically the last several years. Europe has to give meaning to what was practically foundational in the construction of the European Union, which is what does a social market economy mean today? What does it mean to have an economy that has one component of identity, social cohesion, but which also has the capacity to compete in the global economy. That has not been resolved by Europe, uh, how one can have a social pact for the 21st century with such characteristics. And there's not been resolution, or there's not been digestion of the ag agreement to go forward with the Euro and monetary union. I think it was done when the final decision was made in 1998, 1999. It was done believing that it was very much like a central bank whose exclusive task was uh, to ensure price stability, accompanied by what was called a stability pact, that the member countries should commit themselves to not going beyond 3% deficit or not going beyond uh, 60 debt should not exceed 60% uh, of GDP. Those were the basic elements. I don't think that was a bad pact. It was a necessary condition, but clearly insufficient to set in motion a monetary union. Why? Because the pact did not include an obligation to ensure the convergence of the various countries of the union around economic and fiscal policy. So even countries such as Spain, I don't know if you know that Spain was the country that best fulfilled the pact that set the conditions of the monetary union. Spain had a 2% surplus over a gross product. Uh, Germany had 3.3, 3.4% deficit. Spain had a debt on its of 37% of GDP, a little under 37%, and Germany, 84%. So just to make a comparison, in the same, Ireland was in the same position. I'm talking about uh, Spain uh, as a basis for a comparison. It had much better public accounts than France, Italy, Germany. And in late 2007 and even 2008, this was still the case. Now, what happened 18 months after the collapse of Lehman Brothers? Not only did Spain lose that surplus, but its public debt jumped exponentially. Now it's at about 100% of GDP, and the deficit reached 10% and so on. Therefore, what was not anticipated, and I uh, speak from the, where I'm from, what was not anticipated was the asymmetrical impact that a crisis would have on the various countries of the Union because of the lack of convergence in, its, uh, in the economies and in fiscal policy. That wasn't anticipated, and that is what has happened. Now, what has happened with respect to the crisis? I don't want to compare it with anything because some of the comparisons might be bothersome. Now, in a short-term perspective, 
Europe has made a mistake in its approach to the crisis, and it's likely that it's made a mistake because of the much greater relative weight of Germany than other countries. France has wanted to uh, attempt this, that every time there's uh, been an agreement, France has wanted to add to the agreement, agreement on such and such, and France always added, and growth. The Stability Pact is called a uh, pact for stability and growth, but what we've seen is stability but never growth, and it's always as a sort of adornment. So the greater weight of Germany and its obsession with austerity has turned European policies into a crisis uh, on as great as that of 2008, and all in pro-cyclical policies, adjustment policies. To the contrary of what the United States has done from minute one with the Federal Reserve and with active policies to uh, bolster demand and fight unemployment. Europe has not done this. We are paying the price now. Some are saying that they're reviewing it because of the emergence in Greece of a political force that is, say, a bit uncomfortable for the system. It's not anti-system because they play within the system. But that that is changing? No. Uh, the review of those policies in Europe began earlier, not uh, long ago, but it has the huge problem that they come with very little and late. Uh, to have batteries that are not well charged and late, a South African finance minister told me four, five years ago, I, I presented that report that was referred to. And I had a meeting, among others, with the South African finance minister. And he said to me, what's happening with the European Union? You, we don't see them coming around the curve yet. It's a very nice uh, image. Can't see them coming around the curve yet. So it's clear. I see the criticisms that are made here in terms of economic policy as well. But it's very evident that if one compares similar magnitudes, the uh, short-term policies of the United States for fighting the crisis have been much more efficient. And I also think that in terms of structural reform as well, but in Europe that's not even been suggested. And I've avoided speaking about Spain, as you can see. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to move a little bit uh, into something that you said several years ago. You were one of the first, I think, European political figures that spoke out very strongly about the growth of European populism. Um, and that it was a, a great challenge to European solidarity and unity. I was struck, Dr. Brzezinski, for several years, has been talking about a global political awakening that we're seeing unfolding in the Middle East. Some could argue we've seen it unfold in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Is Europe experiencing its own generational political awakening? And this awakening is nationalistic, it's xenophobic, um, some could argue it's uh, anti-Semitic. And how can Europe address these growing sentiments? This is, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Greek Prime Minister Tsipras. He has just made some very strong statements about the lack of solidarity of Spain and Portugal. Uh, you have Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban arguing for illiberal democracy. Is this a political awakening that may be anti-European, anti-global, uh, anti-immigrant in orientation? Or do you think this is an anomaly brought on by a very prolonged economic crisis? I like to think that it is an anomaly that only depends on the seriousness of the crisis. I'm not sure. I think that there's a more important backdrop. I think that there is a nationalist awakening which obviously accelerates when each country can argue that it's the other's fault that things aren't going well. And if the other is the immediate neighbor, then it's all the more comfortable position to adopt. Therefore, what you call populism has a nationalist dimension, 
it, for me, it's the same. If it's put forward uh, from uh, the far right or the far left, there's really not much difference in terms of uh, th uh, your construction of Europe. Now, it is true if, if there's acceleration, and we've had seven years of crisis, and since you've cited Greece, well, Greece in 2010, it was a day in March, one of these days, like today. The Council of Europe was in its spring meeting, and I was invited as the chair of the group on reflection. They called it the Committee of Wise Men on the Future of Europe. And it was the first act of the Greek tragedy, because it was the day that Papandreou, in an extemporaneous uh, attack of honor uh, with all of the uh, 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 looking at the situation of the accounts in Greece. And uh, the response of the Greek uh, governments in the face of such bad news was to kill the messenger. They didn't kill him uh, right away, but they did right thereafter. Uh, now, I would say, and it, it was improper it, even for his last name. This never would have happened to the old Papandreou, but the new Papandreou it told the truth about Greece's accounts. Well, I was at the Council of Europe that day, and uh, I uh, witnessed this directly. Now, five years onward, and I'll just use one parameter so as to not bore you. Greece, at that time, had a debt that was 120% of its GDP. Five years later, with Tsipras coming into power, I am from Andalusia. And I think that the problem that this man has is that the uh, Shipras don't come out. It's going to have to be, they'll have to be reconstituted. But, but he's right in part, as does any movement of resistance to that, and another part in respect of which is not right. But five years later, Greece has seen a decline of uh, GDP of 25%. Now, it, since the way in which that burden is borne is extremely unequal, listen to this, half of the Greek population Half the Greek population, in terms of wealth per inhabitant, has lost 50% of the wealth per inhabitant in five years. Half the population has. And believe me, those things, well, it's miraculous that they survive with votes, because historically it was with boots, not with votes. So this has to be understood. So we find ourselves in a situation of unbearable tension. They've lost half their wealth. Well, 25% of half have lost half. 25% have lost practically everything. Some have lost very little. So uh, here we have, find that Greece, five years later, owes 175% of its GDP instead of 125 or 120%. And the recipe that they continue to call for is continued cutbacks in spending. Greece's problem is not so much a problem of expenditure. When I say not so much, I'm introducing a nuance. It's less of an issue of spending than income. In Greece, taxes aren't paid. And it's very difficult to sustain universal access to health care or access to education and so forth without taxes. Greece, well, I could cite any number of figures. I was responsible for this in part when uh, Spain entered the European Union and renegotiated the structural uh, cohesion funds. Greece, for 20 years, has received a net transfer from the European Union of more than 4.5 percent of uh, GDP. More than 4.5 percent. This. Uh, as a result, any number of works have been carried out in Greece, not always as well dimensioned as in Spain, and 80% financed by German banks, French banks, and Austrian banks. Now, 175% of the uh, Greek debt, whatever you can draw your own conclusion, is is not with the German bank th uh, three eighths as five years ago to tw one fourth. Uh, for France, 15% uh, Austria. Now that debt 
is with the contributors to the countries of the Union, including Spain, which put in 26 billion euros and uh, had no exposure whatsoever to Greece. Now, it's true that they've uh, lashed out against Spain and Portugal because after having interacted with Angela Merkel and accounts not turning out best, or turning out better, it's best to uh, lash out at someone who doesn't actually have a real capacity to reply. And I want to get our audience into the discussion. I would be remiss if I did not ask you about Spanish political developments. We have a very important election, Spanish election coming at the end of the year, some regional elections happening very soon this month, and of course the question of Catalonia. Uh, we have the rise of a very new political party, Podemos, We Can, uh, which in some ways is probably challenging a bit uh, the Spanish Socialist Party in, in votes. Give me your thoughts and your reflections on, on these developments. So what, for an American audience, what should we understand about all of this? Perhaps the most important thing that you should understand is that the configuration of political governance in Spain around two parties who are going back and forth between center-left and center-right with some uh, complementary forces. Well, it seems that that has run its course. Now, where are we headed? Well, to make you understand it here in the United States, I could say we are moving towards an Italian model, but without any Italians. It's not the same thing. In Spain, the dominant factor was defined by unamuno. It is the tragic sense of existence. And the dominant factor in Italy, fortunately for Italy, is let's live as well as we can because life is short. Therefore, if we have an Italian political configuration within a year, but nobody would understand that a prime minister uh, like Renzi with the great will to reform, well, that the first step to be taken was to make a pact with Berlusconi in order to go forward with reform. That won't be understood in Spain. We have a, we'd have a, a governance crisis around the corner that we'd have to reflect upon, not of three political forces, but of four. Because, well, I don't know if there will be time, but a fourth political force is going forward, which is citizens, ciudadanos, which is uh, creating, well, there's a style of coming up with uh, names for parties that are different uh, from what was the vocation of parties. The vocation of parties was to point to a certain segment of society based on its ideological inclination. But now, with the rise of new parties, well, normally, it's not with the vocation of a party, but rather a movement. Podemos is we, can, we all can, especially those below can against those who are at the top. Uh, we are at the bottom, uh, those who are at the bottom being more and those at the top being fewer. That's a sort of ideological definition. Citizens, ciudadanos, is uh, we looked upon positively. We want to be citizens, bearers of rights and obligations. But it's not a way we want to be citizens who are Democrats or Republicans or left or right or uh, pensioners. So there will be four uh, political actors, I believe. Well, will, that be, will it match what the polls are saying today? I don't think so. I think that the governing party, and I hope to say this in a way that is not offensive, I uh, don't want to be taken to task. Uh, for saying this abroad, but I think the uh, foreign minister is very understanding. The government party has moved in its positions very far to the right and is leaving open uh, the central space on the political spectrum. Why? Because it is thought, and it's they're not necessarily wrong, that the Socialist Party, which should occupy the central part of the spectrum is 
more concerned about looking at Podemos rather than about the abandoned space at the center. So now the governing party is seeing that Ciudadano doesn't have that problem and might grow in the cities. There are new formulas and such. Now, Podemos, it uh, bothers them. Well, I think citizens have the right to vote for whoever they want to, first of all. Second, they're the only ones who have the right to get it right or get it wrong. And so, Podemos has the a typography or a font that it uses, and the word itself is exactly the word that President Maduro used in his last electoral campaign. Not just the name Podemos, but the uh, typography of the letters. If you uh, look at the, compare these visuals, it's very funny to see it. Because now they're trying to dissimulate it. No, it's not a question of that. I was never ashamed of uh, joining forces in my psychopolitical uh, fate with Willy Brandt or with Olaf Palm. I thought it was fine. Therefore, these uh, young persons who are doing a very good job at psychopolitics, knowing what sentiments are and not making commitments in terms of responses, because that's the end of psychopolitics, and that's where the preacher is going to have to begin to distribute wheat, which is not the same thing. So that's the situation in the, for, say, a year down the road. It is uh, of concern. Now that Italians are falling in love with the Spanish model, we're moving towards the Italian. Burning towards an Italian political model. I have to think on that a little bit more. Well, thank you. Uh, those are really uh, interesting comments. As a European analyst, I could go on forever. I'm going to hold myself back. There's so many global questions we could ask. Let's raise some questions. We'll take a few, and then you can decide which ones we can turn. We have a colleague in the back in, and one here in the front. If you could please identify yourself and your affiliation, and we're we're a little short on time, so if you keep that question very short, we would be very grateful. Thank you. Please. Sure. Thank you for this great conversation and the opportunity to ask to the President Gonzalez. I'm going to ask him in Spanish. President Gonzalez. President Gonzalez, you're well known for your relationship with Latin America, and I'm surprised that you haven't mentioned it, and I cannot help but ask you about two things that are happening right now in this geopolitics that you've described. The first is, how do you see the delicate situation in Venezuela? And the second is, to be brief, How do you see the new stage in the relationship between Cuba and the United States? And your sentiments, sensations about where we are headed in a view of the fragility of these conversations in terms of the relationship Venezuela, Cuba, and the United States. Well, the other alternative today, for today, would have been to have uh, analyzed that. But actually, when the center was so kind as to invite me, it asked me to speak from a European uh, view, not Spanish, regarding the threats to security that weigh on Europe. So that is why I have not wanted to uh, go through all problems in the world. And uh, I'm reminded when you ask about Venezuela of an anecdote. One day, uh, Carlos Andres Perez was speaking at a panel or in an audience, and sitting uh, next to me to my right was an old uh, time politician, Gonzalo Barrio from Acción Democrática. And when Carlos Andres had been speaking for an hour at the podium, he had resolved any number of problems. He had talked about the two Koreas. He had described the whole world situation at a given point in time. Uh, with that emphasis that he would put on things, like a good, uh, like a man from the Caribbean, he would say, Gonzalo Barrio would tell me, he stuttered a little bit, he said, this guy is very good. Very good. What is missing is a little bit of ignorance. And that was a great definition that 
you have to uh, be very concerned about, uh, uh, hold back a little bit before getting into all gardens, so to speak. Now, Venezuela is in a very poor situation, in a very delicate position, economically, socially, and a very delicate situation institutionally. Very recently, President Maduro criticized the a, a unemployment, child mortality, and so forth in Spain. And uh, then he said, and I hope I'm not misunderstood, he then invited everyone to make a comparison between what was happening in Spain and what was happening in Venezuela. And I don't reproach him for criticizing what he criticized with respect to Spain, because in part, though with some exaggeration, he was telling a truth that I agree with, intolerable uh, unemployment and so forth. And But he would have to tell us that in good faith, in Venezuela, uh, ideally, they should abide by their own rules of the game. That is to say, they should recover their own institutional solidity. So the central bank could give the figure about what's happening with the economy, as is its obligation, or the Minister of Economy and uh, Finance. I hope that the situation is overcome through dialogue, through uh, politically and economically. It cannot be sustained, but it can no longer be sustained. We've gone past the limit of what is unsustainable, and that has to be corrected. One can say that there's a problem, and it is legitimate to say so a problem of model, and therefore a problem of regime. Yes, but even before being able to say that, I would say there is a problem of uh, the government not respecting its, uh, the constitutional and institutional framework that it has given itself that does not allow imprisoning a representative of the citizens bringing into crisis representative democracy now it is true, since they always come up with uh, clever responses. They say that in Venezuela, there are no political prisoners, but rather there are politicians who are in prison. And it's, I think it's fine for them to say so. There are politicians who are in prison because they are politicians. Politicians who are de democratic representative of uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of citizens, and therefore they lose their physical freedom and citizens lose their freedom to elect the person of their choosing. Therefore, there is a political crisis and an economic crisis that is unsustainable with 70% some inflation, with an exchange rate that is uh, six and a half bolivars per dollar, when in the street it's at 180 bolivars per dollar. Well, that cannot be maintained. That leads to the consequences that we're seeing, which are striking uh, under supply crisis. It's truly exasperating. But to put it so in uh, soft terms, if someone obtains a dollar at the official exchange rate to buy inputs that are needed in Venezuela, it's very difficult to resist the temptation of uh, changing something at six that has cost you six and a half when you can sell it for 180 and uh, have a 1,200 rate of return with the, just that transaction. So I, I don't want to be negative. I want to uh, be propositional. And uh, pro speaking propositionally, I think that the government and the opposition have to sit down and talk immediately. Then they have to talk with the productive sectors, and they need to come up with an adjustment plan. I hope that Angela Merkel doesn't hear me, because and it needs to be serious, because when you have a 15 percent deficit in the central government, there's another part of the deficit that has been distributed. Uh, it's difficult for the a country to go forward, especially with oil at half the price of what it was uh, four months ago. So this is a very tough situation, very tough for freedoms, for democratic development, and for the Venezuelan economy and society. I'd like it resolved elsewhere. But you asked me a second uh, question about Latin America. Ah, Cuba, United States. Well, so there can be no doubt about it. 
for me, it is very good news that that door is being opened. Why do I see it as very good news? Well, when President Bush, the first President Bush, was vice president, I put to him for the first time, I'm talking about 1983, a possible change in the uh, strategy on the relationship with Cuba. And later, when he was president, I put this, uh, put for this forward uh, in a meeting on Cuba-European Union. And it was frustrated, say, in 1996. Now, it shouldn't be understood that it was frustrated because there was a change in government in Spain. Rather, it uh, was frustrated because two uh, airplanes were shot down with no justification whatsoever over Havana in February 1996, when there was already a verbal agreement that had been closed on European Union Cuba. And if, if, if you, you know what that agreement was about, and if you wanted some idea about uh, what Raul Castro might be uh, speaking about, the template was the relationship between uh, Europe and Vietnam. The idea was to do something similar with Cuba, protection of individual freedoms, uh, elimination of crime against the revolution, there was no issue of pluralism, but respect for human rights and economic opening. But I think that Fidel knew that for a Cuban, that meant something different than for a Vietnamese. Well, and I'm pleased to say so. A Cuban will not uh, shut up either uh, if they take away crime against revolution, they won't take that away. And Fidel knew that, and so there was a difference. Now, I'm happy about this. It is somewhat saddening to know that we, who have worked so much uh, to, as a country to get past this uh, stage, have been, for us to say that we've been uh, neglected, if not absent, at the time that this actually happens. But I look positively on it. There will be problems. Cuba, for a long time, became accustomed to re uh, responding, uh, to be waiting for the uh, to be hit and then to to hit back. Uh, do this, do that. Uh, don't do this. Don't do that. But you have to get used to that. Indeed, I think that whatever the correlation of forces in the United States, talking about politics and po or policy. Well, the uh, veto cross, veto, vetocracy has also become installed. That's a problem we have in democracies. But I don't think that there's any turning back in the us cuba relationship. But since you've tied this to the question with Venezuela, imagine uh, yesterday in the morning or the day before yesterday, I was with President Santos of, of Colombia in Madrid discussing how peace talks were going forward in Havana with a special envoy from the United States to those negotiations well, of the many conflicts that we can analyze, it's uh, the only one that has uh, bright prospects. And we were examining more in private the implications of this circumstance situation of Venezuela, U.S.-Cuban relations, peace negotiations, and the likelihood of an end coming to that conflict. It's interesting. In a region such as Latin America, which I find most passionate, uh, which is going through a tough time, particularly the Atlantic uh, side with uh, crises that are different in each case, but from Venezuela to Patagonia, there are problems. But it is the region with the best and brightest opportunities in the world at this time and with the least conflict. We're going to have to end the questions there. I think there's not a continent we haven't touched, and it's with great privilege that I invite uh, Dr. Brzezinski uh, to take the podium for some closing marks to provide uh, some context to all of this rich discussion. Dr. Brzezinski is the, uh, is the CSIS counselor and trustee, and co-chairs our CSIS advisory board. Um, as a former U.S. national security advisor, we at CSIS are extremely privileged to to hear his insights on a daily basis. So with that, thank you, and welcome, Dr. Richardson. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be extremely brief, because I know we're running behind time, and I want to concentrate on only one issue. Um, you have given us a wonderful presentation in which you started by a comment 
to the effect that you like to work with your hands. And that causes me to reflect on the meaning of that, because there is a great deal of meaning to it. When you work with your hands, you work with some inanimate, uh, inanimate object. And you infuse into it creativity and purpose and a message. In effect, you transit from the practical to the poetic. But poetic can be very insightful. And I think that related very nicely to the three points you made about Europe, about the Middle East, and China. I will only mention, for the sake of brevity, the Middle East. You spoke correctly about the dilemmas that we face, and you also warned us against getting involved with our boots. And I very much agree with that. But you also infused a poetic message here, which struck me, as I listened to you, as very strategically relevant. And I say this in part because I admired what you said, and I regret it that I haven't thought of it myself. <laughs> Namely, that we're dealing with a hostile force which is deeply embedded in the past. The whole sort of basic movement of fanaticism, of atrocities, is not a religious expression. It's a perversion of religion in a context of a refusal to move forward, which is taking place, however, in the world of Islam. You mentioned Morocco. And the brilliant insight here was that the force we are being opposed by is a force which practices and insists on total subordination of women to men. And I should think that for the moderate Arab regimes, and particularly for us from the outside, we should speak for the poetic solution to the problem of Arab Islamic retardation. Namely, to be modern, to be co-equal, to be religiously correct with the spirit of Muhammad. You have to undergo a fundamental revision in the relationship between the male and the female parts of Arab populations something that which is happening voluntarily in some parts, something which is happening against resistance, and something is, which is totally repressed and denied. And such a cause can give our role much more meaning. So I thank you for that insight, and more broadly, for a very stimulating and poetic and political presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all so much, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, colleagues. This was a, a wonderful conversation. We look forward to future programming uh, with the Brzezinski Institute, and we wish you a great day. Thank you again for joining us.